Okay, so let's continue the session. <clears throat> so before the lunch break, we have discussed the serverless as well as provisioned model of Cosmos DB deployment. Now let's continue to the next section. Moving data into and out of Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL. In this, we are going to see how we can connect the other data storage solutions and data processing solutions with Cosmos DB. So first of all, we can connect Azure Data Factory, that is ADF, with the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL. So we can connect this as a linked service with the Azure Data Factory. For that, inside your data factory, you can configure the connection to Cosmos DB by using the uh, connection string. So you can see the configuration here. Inside the uh, data factory, the connection parameters you can specify like a Cosmos DB as the connection type and the authentication we can done using the connection string. So we can specify the connection string parameter. And we can also specify the uh, read operation for reading a specific set of data. For that, we can select our, we can specify a read query. So <clears throat> in the query session, we can specify the SQL type of query. So I have already mentioned in Cosmos DB for NoSQL, we can perform the read operations by writing the SQL type of query syntax. So we can, we can write the SQL-like syntax or SQL-like of query to specify the read operation. And also you can specify from which of the regions you want to on the read operation because uh, we mostly we don't do the read operations in the primary region, so we can select, specify any secondary regions for read operations. So for writing to the Cosmos DB, we can specify the type as Cosmos DB SQL API sync and the write behavior as absurd. So absurd means in case if the uh, record with the spe specific ID already exists, then it, uh, sorry, if the record is not existing, then it will insert as a new record. Means it is updating the record or if the, if the record is not updated, uh, sorry, not existing, then it will be inserting as a new record. That's what the absurd operation. Move data by using the Kafka connector. So Kafka connect is a tool within the Apache Kafka suite to stream data between Kafka and other data systems like a Cosmos DB. So in if you are working with the Kafka clusters or if Kafka connector you are using, you can specify Cosmos DB as a data storage or data solution that connects with the Kafka. So you can specify the connection parameters for Cosmos DB, that is uh, connect.cosmos.connection.endpoint, then you can specify the connection URI. Then master key you can specify, that is the authentication key, database name and the container name. Then you can read the data from Cosmos DB. So what are the different uh, parameters that you want to read? So you can specify the Cosmos DB read operations parameters. So from where, what is the connection endpoint? So uh, what is a uh, 
model class that you are using. So all parameters you can specify to enable the read operation. To write the data into the uh, Cosmos DB, so you can use the Kafka topics. So you will be means whenever the producer application writes the data into uh, the Kafka, which can be then written into the Cosmos DB. So uh, the data which is received in the Kafka topics will be uh, written into Cosmos DB. So the publisher application can uh, make request to the Kafka topics, which will be then uh, forwarded to the Cosmos DB. You can even connect stream analytics. The Azure stream analytics also supports multiple output syncs, including Cosmos DB for NoSQL. So if you are working with the stream analytics, you can use the uh, Cosmos DB as the output data storage. There also you need to specify the connection configuration for Cosmos DB, like uh, uh, the endpoint URI, authentication key, database, and the container names. The Azure Stream Analytics query results are processed as JSON when returned to Cosmos DB for NoSQL. Means when you when you perform the uh, right operations, the data which is produced or processed in uh, Stream Analytics will be converted into JSON and then it is written into the Cosmos DB. Just a minute, just I'll be back in one minute. Okay, sorry, let's continue. Okay, so the data which is processed in the stream analytics will be converted into JSON and it is written into the Cosmos DB. The items are upserted to the Cosmos DB for NoSQL based on the value of the ID field. Because upsert operation means you can do the updation to the existing records that means if the record already exists with the same ID, it to perform the update operation. But if the record with, this, with that ID is not existing, then it will be inserting as a new record. That is the upsert operation. Move data using the Azure Cosmos DB Spark connector. With Azure Synapse Analytics and Azure Synapse Link for Cosmos DB, you can create cloud native uh, HTAP to run analytics over your data in Cosmos DB for NoSQL. 
So if you are uh, using the Azure Synapse Analytics, you can uh, connect to Cosmos DB for performing the data operations. Means if you want to connect uh, to Cosmos DB for read or write the operate, uh, data, you can uh, use the Azure Synapse link for Cosmos DB that enables the connection between Azure Synapse Analytics and the Cosmos DB. So if you are working on the data uh, management or data platforms, data science or data analytics, then you can use these services to connect with Cosmos DB. So this is why I have mentioned in the beginning, if you are planning to use any uh, uh, integration with Azure Data Services, then you have to use the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL because the other Cosmos DB APIs does not support integration with uh, uh, the other Azure services. So here we have seen that we can connect the Cosmos DB with uh, different uh, data related services like a uh, stream analytics, Kafka, Okay, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, Apache Kafka or uh, Stream Analytics kind of services or Data Factory kind of services you can use to uh, connect with Cosmos DB and you can perform read or write operations using uh, the Cosmos DB database. So that's the end of the second module. So in the second module, we have discussed how we can configure the throughput and how the how to perform the capacity planning, uh, right? Like uh, how to calculate the request unit and how to uh, provision the databases as a provisioned compute model or serverless compute model. And then we have seen how uh, or what are the different other Azure services we can use to connect with Cosmos DB. Now in the third module, if you are a developer, this will be more interesting for you because if you want to build applications that is cloud native applications for connecting your uh, applications to the Cosmos DB, you can use the SDK. So if you are a, a .NET developer or a Java developer or JavaScript developer or Python developer, whatever language you use, you can use the Azure Cosmos DB SDK to connect to Azure Cosmos DB from your applications. So in this module, we are going to see how we can use the Azure S, uh, Cosmos DB SDK to connect to the Cosmos DB database. Since this is a Microsoft certification, they are focusing on C Sharp language only. Yes, it is possible for us to use any language for uh, writing code and connecting to uh, Cosmos DB, but in the exam point of view, uh, it is using the C Sharp or Node.js. So these are the main two languages mostly used uh, for every Microsoft exam. So if you are a uh, .NET developer, you can go ahead with the C Sharp language, or if you are comfortable with Node.js, then you can use Node.js as well. So that is the two uh, primary languages used in most of the Microsoft exams, but for AI ex related exams, uh, Python is also considered. Python or C Sharp will be considered. But yes, C Sharp will be the primary language for all the uh, code demos uh, associated with the Microsoft exam. So here also you can see a lot of uh, examples in C sharp. So here we will understand how to import and use the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL SDK. First of all, we need to understand what are the different packages we will be using 
or what are the different uh, uh, classes we will be using to build the applications to connect that connect with the Cosmos DB. First of all, that there is a Cosmos client. The Cosmos client class is part of the Microsoft.Azure.Cosmos namespace, and that is used to, uh, to establish a connection with your Cosmos DB account. So you will be specifying the connection parameters like a connection string or the authentication key and uh, endpoint to connect to the Cosmos DB account. So the client is used to uh, establish a connection with the Cosmos DB account. The database class is used to represent the Cosmos DB database. So when you perform any database related operations like uh, creating a container or creating, uh, sorry, configuring the database level parameters, okay, then you will be using the database uh, class instance. Similarly, we have a container class. That container class is used to represent a uh, database container, means a collection inside your Cosmos DB. So any read write operations of items you will be doing based on the container class. So if I have to insert an item, you can do that using the container class. So all the common operations we will be doing with the help of the container class instance. The Microsoft Azure, Microsoft Azure Cosmos library we will be using for .NET SDK. So in Python or uh, JavaScript, the library name can be different, but yes, the same operations can be performed using those libraries as well. So for C Sharp, that means for .NET applications, we have to install the Microsoft.Azure.Cosmos library. We can install the packages using the NuGet package manager or the uh, .NET command line. So if you are using a .NET command line, you can simply use the .NET add package command to install the uh, Microsoft.Azure.Cosmos package. To install a specific version of the package, you can use the version name along with the package name. That means while installing, you can specify hyphen hyphen version to indicate the version uh, of the package, so which version you want to install. So once you install the package into your application, the package reference will be added into the CS project file, that is the .NET project file, so that you can see a project reference. So here you can see a project reference which store the reference about the pa package which is installed into the project. Then inside the code file, you can import the namespace that is microsoft.azure.cosmos and then create a connection uh, using the uh, Cosmos client class. So Cosmos client accepts a connection string as an argument and then <clears throat> you can specify uh, or you can uh, uh, create a database instance using the client class. So the client class is uh, can be created either by using the connection string or by using the endpoint and the key because obviously the connection string again contains the key and endpoint only. So you can create the Cosmos client either by using the connection string or by using the key and endpoint. So you can read the properties of your Cosmos DB account by using the read account async, which will give the information about your Cosmos DB account. That is uh, the ID, 
the, that that we, that is the account ID. Readable regions that are uh, if you have enabled the geo replication, you will get a list of uh, readable regions. Otherwise, the write region itself is coming as the read region. Then writable regions. If you have enabled a multi-region write, then what are the different writable regions? The list of regions will be available. Consistency is uh, used to understand what are the what is the consistency default the consistency level configured in the account. So consistency level we'll be discussing later. So there are, as I have mentioned it before, so there are five different consistency levels available. Eventual, consistent prefix, session, bounded, staleness, and uh, strong. In that session is the default one which is configured. But yes, you can go to the portal and change the default consistency level. After you create the client instance, we can create a database instance by using the client. So client.get database is used to get the reference of an existing database. But if database does not exist, you can create a new database by using the create database async method. But you can do a checking whether the database exists or not. If not existing, then you can ask the uh, client API to create a new database. For that, we can use the create database if not exist async method. Once the database is created, using the database instance, you can get the container reference. For that, you can use a get container method that will return the container reference. And if you want to create a new container, then you can use the create container async method of the database class or database object. You can specify the uh, container name, partition key, so you can see the partition key is always starting with a slash. Okay. And also the throughput. So what is the container level throughput you want to configure? You can specify that as well. The create container if not exist async is used to create a container if it is not existing. And if it is already existing, it returns the reference of that existing container. Implement client singleton. Cosmos client class features implement on, on your behalf. That is, instances are already thread safe. That means you don't need to make any thread safe uh, explicit coding. The Cosmos client is already thread safe. Instances efficiently manage the connections. So the connection pools and connection management is uh, done using the Cosmos client and instances cache addresses when operating in the direct mode. So direct mode is a type of the mode that uh, we will discuss later. So uh, the Cosmos client is following a singleton pattern. It maintains the information about the connection opened within the application. Okay. So you can create a single instance of the client class, uh, Cosmos client class, and uh, uh, create the database or get the database reference and perform the database and container level operations. The Cosmos connectivity modes. The Cosmos client options class is providing a range of options that you can configure for the client when you connect to the account. Okay, So that means when you create a Cosmos client object, you can specify the connection string 
and an options parameter or the key and endpoint along with the options parameter. So here you can see we are we are creating a Cosmos client options class and passing this as the third parameter in the constructor. Or when you use connection string, it is passed as a second parameter. So that means Cosmos client options you can specify. So what, what we can specify in the Cosmos client options? So first thing we can specify is the connection mode. So you can specify a connection mode as direct or gateway. Direct means if your application is directly connecting to the Cosmos DB account using the URI. But in gateway method, your client application is connecting to a gateway endpoint and that is establishing connection to the uh, Cosmos DB accounts. So this approach is suitable when your application is running in a corporate network uh, where the firewall is implemented. So in that cases, the uh, gateway approach is better because it uh, hit your request will be hitting to an endpoint and that is then forwarding that request to the appropriate instance. But if you are running your application not from the corporate uh, network and there is no firewall restrictions uh, such that, then you can use the direct connection approach. So if you look into the documentation, Okay, so here you can see the connectivity modes. Gateway mode is supported on all SDK platform. If your application runs within a corporate network with a strict firewall restrictions, gateway mode is the best choice because it uses a standard HTTPS port and a single DNS endpoint. The performance trade-off However, is uh, the gateway mode involves an additional network hope because it is not directly connecting to the uh, database account. It's every data is read from or written to Azure Cosmos DB. We also recommend gateway connection mode when your application runs, when you run applications in environment that are limited number of socket connections. Because suppose if you are if you are using direct mode, you will be establishing connection from your instances to the database. So where you have very less number of socket connections opened in your corporate network, then it will be difficult for you to connect to the database. Okay, because we have very limited set of connections allowed, external connections allowed. Such cases, gateway method is better. But direct method, if you use, Direct method supports connectivity through TCP protocol using TLS for initial authentication and encrypting the traffic. That means you use the direct TCP protocol connection and uh, TLS is used for the authentication security. And offers better performance because there are fewer network hopes. Once it is creating a direct connection and the application connects directly to the backend replicas. Okay, that means your application is directly connecting to the database replicas. Direct mode is currently only supported on .NET and Java SDK platforms. So if you look into this, so the one is gateway mode, which means when you make a request, it is a default HTTPS request mode that goes to this uh, gateway node. So this is the gateway node which is then connecting to your backend replicas. So these are the database replicas. But in case of connection mode two, that is uh, uh, direct connection, we establish a TCP connection, which it directly goes to the database replica. That means simply database account. 
So that means direct connection is much faster because there is no intermediate hope. But when your application is running in a behind a network firewall or in a corporate network, the recommended option is to use a gateway mode, so which will hit uh, to a gateway node and then forwarding that request to the appropriate backend nodes. Inside the Cosmos client options, you can also specify the region. So you can specify the application region. So what is the benefit of that? It uh, connect to the nearest region. So suppose if I'm specifying West US, it will be connecting to the West US replication or West US replica if you have geo geographically replicated your data. So when you want to perform read operations, you can specify the application regions. So the read operations will be served from that location. So uh, that means your nearest location can be this one. You can configure a custom failover or priority list also. That means Cosmos client options, you can specify the preferred regions, which is a list of regions that means it will try to establish connection with the West US first. If the West US is not available, it will fail over to East US. That means you can specify the list of regions in the connection uh, client options where it uh, go through each instance wherever the connection is available. Okay, so that means you can specify the preferred connection method or the priority method is uh, saying West US is the preferred connection point. But in case if the West US is not available, then it goes to the East US. It is also possible to specify the concurrency mode or con sorry, the consistency level or consistency mode. So I said the default consistency level is session, but if you are expecting to change or if you are if you are expecting to set the consistency level as uh, eventual, then you can modify that in the connection parameter. So when you establish a connection in the client options, you can also specify the consistency level. So what is this consistency levels? Difference, I will show you uh, when I go to the portal. So these are the different uh, consistency levels available. Bounded stainless, consistent prefix, eventual, session, and strong. So eventual is the least consistent model, and the strong is the strongest consistency level. So after eventual, next is consistent prefix. After consistent prefix, there is session. After session, more strong is bounded stainless, and the highest consistency level is the strong. So let us see how we can build an application that connects to the Cosmos DB account. But before that, Let me verify whether this Cosmos DB account is there. Yeah. And I have I have this keys. So you can use the key and endpoint or the connection string. So what I'm going to do, I'll create a simple application. So I'm creating a .NET for MVC application.
So I can give the name as Okay, I just given the name as event manager web. Selecting the framework version as eight and create. You can do this in lab, but I'm not following the lab. See here we have We have the web application created. Okay, just a minute. I'll just uh, reshare the screen. Okay, so let's Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is to store the connection string inside the configuration file. So in .NET, we have the uh, configuration file that is the app settings.json. So here I can specify so what is the connection string that you have to copy? from the portal. So here is the primary connection string, which we can copy. I'm just taking this into here. Then we can also specify the database name. It is sample DB. And if you want, you can use a different name if you want. Like I'll say it, demo DB. Collections name. So the collection name I am using events, something like this. So I have the connections thing, database and collections. So let's let me go and create a simple code to connect to that. First of all, I 
I'm going to create a service class. Now create a folder. So I'm naming it as Cosmos Helper. So there's a helper service class. Now to use Cosmos DB, I have to install the NuGet packages. Either I can use the CLI command or I can use the package manager here. So I'm using the package manager here. Azure dot Swiss. So Microsoft dot Azure dot Cosmos, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the one Microsoft.Azure.Cosmos. So it's a, I think it's a preview version. So I will switch to a stable version that is 3.41 and installing that. This is installing the package version 3.41. Now inside of this, we can import the namespaces. This is the namespace which is required. Then we can declare certain variables. So private. Cosmos client. Sorry, inside of the class. It's like outside of the private Cosmos client. Client. Private database. Database. Private container and container. So I have declared all the required variables. Now inside the constructor, I can establish the connection to the client. So for that, this is the constructor, and I have to go and read the configuration. Uh, parameters that is connection string database and collection names so let's go and uh, read it To get the connection string, I can simply use the connection string configuration dot get value of string and get the similarly we can get. The database name and the container name. Now it's very easy for us to establish a connection. So for that, let's uh, create the client. So client equal to new, and then you can specify the connection string. 
And then using this client, I can create the database reference. I can say database equal to client dot create database if not exist a sync. So you can specify that database name here. Then container equal to database dot create container if not exist a sync. And you can specify the container name. So what is the partition key you want? Suppose if I want the partition key as maybe ID itself, then you can specify that new partition key. ID property, it is string property path. Okay, so then it goes. Fine, this is fine. Throughput, I'm not using, so it will use the default value. If you want, you can explicitly specify the throughput. Do this. So throughput, you can specify explicitly, or you can ignore to set it as the default. So now we got the container. Uh, now inside this, you can, if I want to insert a record, you can. Okay, so let's use public. Create even a sync. And then I have to pass an event object here. So for passing the event object, we can create a event class. I'm just using a very simple model class. The models already exist. Let's create it. So I'm just creating a couple of variables.
That's it. One title and date is fine. So I am simply calling the create item method to insert the object that is the event info class object. Okay, so I'm not writing any additional configurations, just creating this and I can create a method inside the home controller or yeah, inside the home controller, I'm just creating one action. create event. So this is to return the view of the page and let's add a view, simply a razor view I'm adding. A create view that uses the event in frame. So when you do the labs, the sample code will be available in the lab itself. Okay, so you can see the form is created and we have to create a post action for that. So now in this post action, whatever event info I'm receiving, I have to insert that using this helper class method. So for that, this helper class need to be registered as a service. So for registering the service in .NET, we have to go here and register as a service. So you can see I have registered this as a service class and in the controller constructor, we have to inject it. You can see I am injecting the Cosmos helper into the constructor that is in the controller constructor, which I can use here to insert the record. So simply I'm using Cosmos helper dot create event. And then passing this event info. But yes, uh, if So here it is reflection event info scale.
this is a bit of a right. So the, I just updated this method syntax to return the newly inserted item. So whatever is the in result, uh, whatever is the document inserted, that inserted document will be returned. And here I'm calling this in the controller. So here it just uh, returns the result back. I'm not updating any UI changes like just to uh, insert that record. I'm calling this method. And once the record is inserted, it returns the newly inserted object. But one important thing which you have to understand, you have to either pass the ID explicitly here, but if you if, if the user is providing the ID, there is a chance for duplication. So I'm not going to use the ID or I'm not going to pass the ID using the uh, form. Instead of that, inside the controller, I can use the GUID to generate a unique GUID. So event info dot ID, I can use GUID dot new GUID dot to string. So it's going to generate a new GUID every time. So this is the application and I'm just making a small update to the UI for adding a hyperlink to the new page. So there's a hyperlink to uh, load that page. So one thing we have to notice in our Cosmos DB, we will be inserting the records with the lowercase parameters, like a ID will be lowercase. Suppose if you look into the, an existing Cosmos DB account, inside of the data explorer, you can see the sample a record any records that you insert where the id will be coming as a lowercase because in inside the cosmos db most of the parameters specifically the id and other built-in parameters all in lowercase okay but in our class if our if you look into our event info class our member variables are in Caps. If you say ID, I is capital, title T is capital, event date E is capital. So we need to check whether it is automatically serializing, means while converting this into JSON, whether it is automatically converting into lowercase ID. Otherwise, we have to explicitly map it. So let's try that because ID should be in, in the lowercase format. Okay, this runs the application. Okay, let's uh, verify. Okay, this is coming now. What is the parameter names? Azure, Cosmos, or container instead of container. It's I have given collection. Okay.
but it's it's not created so I think it is create event. What is action name? Create event Inside the home only we created this. Now it is giving the event here. Create event return view. Oh, sorry, the spelling is still. Okay, so here sample doc is the title. Let's select the date. Okay, so here you can see the ID. Can you see the input content is invalid because the required parameter ID are missing? That means the ID is not converted into its lowercase format. So what we have to do then, we have to explicitly map it. So inside this, so here, I think this should work. So I'm explicitly trying to map it with the JSON property. Now let's try. Okay, 
So you can see it is not showing any error and the same page is reloaded because we have given return view. So the same page is reloaded. So now we have to verify whether this is created or not. Let's go back. The refresh, you can see the demo DB is created. Inside that we have events collection that is container. And inside that we have the items. So this is the first item which is inserted. You can see the sample talk and the event date is added into the collection. So this is the ID which is generated. This is the unique ID which is generated using this GUID, right? So this is how we can build applications using uh, Cosmos DB. So this is a very simple .NET example how a .NET web application can connect to the Cosmos DB. So I'll just reiterate what are the steps we have done. So we created a web application. Inside this web application, we have configured the connection string, database name, and the container name into the uh, app settings.json file. Then we have created a helper class, which is a services class. The service class, we have defined the variables for Cosmos client, database, and container. So for that, we have installed the package that is Microsoft.Azure.Cosmos. Inside the constructor of that service, we have, because this is I want to create as a singleton, right? Because that's the best practice. Only one connection instance per application. So here, <clears throat> so here it is uh, reading the configurations from the app settings.json file. Using that, we are creating this client that is Cosmos client, and then you can create a database instance, and then we can create a container instance. You can even pass the Cosmos client options here, okay, which I have not used. If you see the next argument is Cosmos client options, where you can specify the uh, consistency level for your uh, connections means all the operations you have to use which consistency level that you can configure or if you want to specify what are the different uh, locations you have to refer if you have enabled the geo replication okay so that parameters you can specify in the cosmos client options which i have not passed so then I have created a sample method for creating a new item. So we have to use the container reference to create an item. We can use the create item method for that. I have an object of type event info class. So event info class contains an ID, but ID is where I is in capital, but Cosmos DB for NoSQL expect ID in lowercase. So we have to explicitly map the ID into lowercase. Okay. So other fields doesn't matter. Okay. But for the ID, it should be in lowercase. Okay. Then after that, I have registered my service as a singleton service, then injected that into the home controller calling that method from the action. So this is how we build the applications using Cosmos DB. OK, so here is a question. What if we have multiple containers and databases? Yes, you have to specify the names of containers and databases. And how many containers you have, that many references you have to create. So here, I have only one container, so I've just used only 
one container reference variable. So in this application code, if I go to here, you can see I have created only one container reference. Suppose if I have two containers, like a, maybe an employee container and events container, then you have to declare two container variables, like a events container, comma employee container. Like this, multiple containers you can create and get the reference to each container. Similarly, multiple databases. Okay, so here I'm not using employee container because I don't have it, but how many containers you have, that number of references you have to use. Because events container is connecting to the events. So here I can give the name as events container name and then read that value, which is used here, right? So how many containers you have, that many references you have to use. Suppose if you have a employees container, you can say, employee container, and here it should be the name of the employee container. Something like this. So here it can be department, can be the partition key. So now you can see there are two containers will be created. But I don't have the second one. So I'm just commenting it. Okay, I hope that clears your doubt. Okay. Offline development. See, uh, when you build Cosmos DB based applications, yes, it is possible for us to create a free tier account, right? Because I have already mentioned, it is possible to create a free tier Cosmos DB account uh, in every subscription, but there is only one free tier available, okay? So consider that if you have already created a uh, free tier account and uh, you have to create a Cosmos DB application, creating a Cosmos DB account and performing the read write operations will incur charge, right? So that means it will charge you because for every read write operation, they will be charging you. But if I have to perform or if I have to create a database application, but I don't want to connect to the Azure Cosmos DB because there are many reasons. First of all, cost. Cost is an important thing because for dev and test scenarios, I don't want to spend money on Cosmos DB. Secondly, latency because every time when I perform the right operations, it will go to the cloud and perform the right and read operations. So that Post and the latency is these are the two important factors while uh, uh, that that, that uh, restricts us to use the Cosmos DP because uh, whenever you build applications locally, every time we have to connect to the cloud Cosmos DB. So they have come up with a solution for that. That is Cosmos DB emulator. So Cosmos DB emulator is. A, uh, simulated application which uh, provides exactly similar environment of or exactly similar service that you can run in your local environment. There are two options. Either you can download the executable file of 
Cosmos DB emulator and install in your local machine, or you can run it through a Docker command or Docker uh, image. Okay. So uh, let me check whether I have already installed it. Now I'm not using Cosmos DB much. Uh, so let's show you the setup. So Cosmos DB emulator, you can use. Installer is there or not, or at least we can use the Docker. Okay, I think it's yeah, so here it's the executable one. So this is the executable one which you can install locally. But if you don't want to install it locally, then no worries. You can go with the Docker container. So this is the Docker image for Cosmos DB emulator. What we can do, if you have Docker in your machine, we can run it locally. It started. Okay. So do, this is a Docker desktop. So I can pull this uh, image by using this command Docker pull. So you can see it is downloading the emulator image to the local machine. Once it is downloaded, we can start the container. Let's take some time to download. But if you want, you can even try with the executable one. This is the executable. Both will be giving the same UI, same environment. It's up to you. The if you So this is the command for starting the emulator. It's still downloading. I think by the time I will show you the. This one.
Okay, this is done. I'll complete this command into a notepad first. Okay, I think this uh, yeah, this emulator is running. There will be certificates also we have to come here. I don't know. I'm not sure the call command is there or not. Okay. Failed to receive handshake. Internal systems. You know, if you say, I'll try to. Run it as local. Welcome to the GUA. Why it's not starting the GUI?
the service is started. Okay, let me try to connect it using some other ID. Connection string. This is the endpoint. If the GUI was available, we could use this. Directly, we'll get the connection string from there. Since it is not available, we have to explicitly construct. Let's try whether it is connecting or not. It's okay. I think it's connected now. Okay, so here you can see this a local host 8081 is connected. So I'll use this connection string to run my application and see whether it is working locally or not. So instead of this cloud connection string, I'm going to use this connection string, which is connecting to the local service that is emulator. Run this application and check so whether it is working or not. So there is no other changes required in the application. So inside the application, you need to just modify the connection string. Instead of using the cloud one, you have to use a local emulator's connection string. So let me test data and provide a value. Okay, it's done. Now let's refresh. Yes, you can see it's created here. Right, so the documents inside the documents, you can see the document is created. Okay, so that means we can build the applications locally using the emulator. So once the development is completed, you can uh, migrate this application to the cloud just by updating the connection string. So you can change the connection string. Let's, let's all the values live as it is. You can see in locally we are able to run it. Okay, so it's creating a demo DB, then events collection, then inside it, the 
items that is documents and there is a single document which is created here now you may be wondering there is no additional fields like uh, uh, in cosmos db it is creating some attachments okay or uh, timestamp something like that so that is in the cloud for concurrency management locally it is not necessary because locally it, there is no concurrency management nothing required so it's a storing as a pure json data okay so in cloud cosmos db it will be adding lots of new fields for concurrency management okay so this is how the emulator works so you saw the application which i have created is now working with the emulator without any code changes only the connection string i have updated handle connection errors since a request would fail for various reasons you should have the error handling logic Yes, since we are connecting to the cloud, there can be uh, reasons for uh, getting errors. The Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL SDK for .NET has built-in logic to handle some transient failures for read and query request. The SDK does not automatically retry a re re uh, write request. Your application could should implement retry logic for failed writes. So that means for read operations means when you execute a read or query operation it will automatically try the retry option because the retry is a pattern used in cloud right so whenever you make a request the first time if the server is not reachable instead of throwing the error it will retry the connection after a few seconds right so that is a retry pattern so that retry pattern is already implemented in, in the read and query functions. But for the write functions, they have not implemented the retry option. So in case, if you want to try writing the code, you have to explicitly implement the retry pattern. The common HTTP status codes where retrying your request makes sense. That is 429, that is too many requests. 449 concurrency error, 500 unexpected service error, and 503 service unavailable. So in all these cases, it will be trying, retrying the connections. Okay. Common HTTP status codes that also might need error handling. So these are error codes uh, like the 429, 449, 500, and 503. The Client package or client function will automatically perform the retry for uh, such errors. But there are some other reasons we may uh, need to perform the retry. That is for 400. 400 means bad request. For example, whenever you try to write the data, you are trying to write a record with an invalid format. For example, the previous example we saw I was trying to write a record without ID because ID was mandatory. And I was writing the ID with the I capital that is not allowed, right? So that is a bad request because it is sending a bad uh, invalid data to the database. Not authorized. So I was trying to, or I am trying to perform some operations which is not allowed. For example, I have established a connection using the read-only connection string. So you know, in Cosmos DB, we can get two type of connection string. If you go here, we can get a We can get a read-only connection string or read-write connection string. Suppose if I have established the connection using read-only, and then I'm trying to perform a read or a write operation, right? So what happens? It is not allowed. So that is an not authorized. Forbidden, the same scenario. You are trying to perform an operation which is not allowed. 
Okay, so not authorized means invalid authentication key or invalid connection string you have used. Not found. We are trying to connect to a server endpoint which is not existing. Means your endpoint or URI can be wrong. So implementing the threading and parallelism. So they have used the async await option for implementing the parallelism or asynchronous operations. So for supporting the asynchronous executions, all the methods are currently created as async methods. Means whether it is a database create operation or a read operation, write operation, all methods you can see ending with async keyword, which means this is all async operations. Okay, so when performing these operations, you have to wait for the result. You can explicitly use the await keyword if it is calling from an asynchronous method. Otherwise, you have to use the result, dot result. So in my case also, I have used it. Whenever I call the async methods from an asynchronous, so whenever I call the async method from an asynchronous function, here you can see this is an asynchronous function. I'm calling an asynchronous action. So I can use the await. But if I'm calling an asynchronous action from a non-asynchronous method, then I have to use the result. For example, inside this constructor, this constructor is not an asynchronous one. Right. So I'm trying to invoke an asynchronous action here. And you can see here. So that time I will be using the dot result, which means it will be waiting for the result of that operation, similar to a wait. Configure max concurrency, parallelism, and the buffered item count. So in the query request option, means when you make a query for reading a batch of records or multiple records, you can specify the parameters like a max item count means in each read operation how many uh, items need to be included okay so you can limit the number of uh, documents that uh, that is coming along with a read operation you can set by using the max item count similarly you can also configure the max concurrency and also the max buffered item count. That is the query buffer, how many items we can buffer in the client side. Max concurrency specifies how many concurrent uh, operations allowed in the uh, client side. I mean, from one application, how many read operations can go at the same time? You can read the data by using the link queue method. Here you can see the container dot get item link queue queryable you can use. That means using the link queue methods, you can query the data because you know link queue methods are actually converting your queries into an SQL kind of syntax. So this get item link queue queryable is going to convert your uh, request into SQL type of query and execute. So here you can, it's a very simple example. We are applying a condition where I dot category ID equal to two dot to feed iterator. So what is this feed iterator is, suppose if we have, we are performing a, a read operation, sometimes it is going to return uh, thousands of records. And it is not possible to process all records in one go. So we have to return these records as a batch. So for that, we use an iterator. So iterator's benefit is first, we will read a, a specific number of records. May suppose if the batch size is 50, first 50 records will come. Then when the iterator execute, another 50 records will come. Then the next next iteration, the the third 50 records will come like this. Uh, the iterator is going to give you uh, a reference to a collection so where you can read the records using a loop. But you can 
return the complete items as a single result by using the to list. But to list is will be very heavy if, if the number of records returning is very huge. Okay, so you can if you want to handle the data in a batch format, you can use the to feed iterator. Okay, so otherwise the to list means you have to wait until the complete records will be loaded into the list. Suppose if there are 10,000 records coming, it, you have to wait until all the 10,000 records are loaded into the list. But to feed iterator, which will just return the iterator reference, using the iterator, you can read batch wise, like uh, 50 records, 100 records in one batch. Avoid client side resource related timeout. Okay, issues at the client machine that cause request timeouts is high CPU utilization and high port utilization. So try to establish minimum number of connections from the application. So that's why the singleton pattern is better. So it will create a single connection from the application. Okay, so and use a single port to connect to the application. Suppose if you are uh, establishing multiple connections from your applications, then it may use multiple sockets. So uh, to avoid the timeouts, you have to reduce the number of instances consumed from the application. Configure logging. So logging is one very, very important factor because you have to understand what is happening and what are the different errors occurred. All informations, if you want to log, you can use a logger. So you can uh, use a Cosmos client builder. So Cosmos client builder is part of the Fluent API, so Microsoft.Azure.Cosmos.Fluent is the namespace. So you can create a builder either by using the connection string or uh, endpoint and key, and then builder.build method is going to return the client. So using the client builder, uh, you can create a client object so that you follow this builder pattern. And create a custom request handler you can implement. So for that, you create a custom logger class, and that is uh, inheriting from the request handler. And you have to override the send async method. So when the send async method is receiving a request object and cancellation token. So whenever the request is received, this method is getting executed, and you can log your request here. So whenever a uh, request comes to the application. This is going to uh, log that into the console. And if you want to send that log uh, to the logger service, you can even use the send async method of the base class. That is the request handling. Okay, so. Cosmos DB's emulator is uh, the next lab, which we have already demonstrated. So that's the end of this module. So in this module, we have seen how we can build applications using Cosmos DB. I've just created, I have just demonstrated with a, a C Sharp application. Now let's take a small break. So we'll take a 10, 15 minutes break. After the break, we will continue with the next topic.
Hello. All are back. Okay, I think we'll continue. Okay, so now let's continue to the next module. So we'll be moving to the the uh, next modules are uh, when I think the module four, five, six, all these are same coding modules. We have already discussed how it can build applications using Cosmos DB, and I don't want to spend more time on coding. So let's move to the next module which it talks about the modeling and partitioning strategy implement a non relational data model and partitioning so we'll see So if you see the difference between the NoSQL and the relational databases, the benefit of using NoSQL databases over uh, relational databases is this is horizontally scalable. So what is horizontally scalable? When we store the data in NoSQL databases, not only Cosmos DB, any other NoSQL database you consider, we will be storing the data in a hierarchical format, mostly in hierarchical format like uh, JSON documents or graph or column family types, where all the related informations are interconnected and there is no need to maintain multiple tables for storing the relate, uh, related informations. For example, if I have to store the details of a particular uh, order, so inside the order, we can store the order informations, customer informations, ordered items information, everything. So that means there is no need to maintain foreign key relationships with the other tables. 
that means every record is independent here which means it does not have any relation with the other documents so we can easily scale this out which means the suppose if i have uh, a single server which can handle maximum 10 request or 100 request at a time if it is if the number of requests is exceeding more than 100 we can add more server to handle more request means we can add a new server which will handle another 100 records and the data which is coming from the client can be stored in that server where we don't need to worry about the first server because every record is independent every record is independent or every document is independent so where you or in which server you store it doesn't matter okay so that means you can sc easily scale out the NoSQL databases compared to the relational databases. Because in relational databases, mostly we do vertical scaling because whenever we feel that, okay, the database uh, performance is very low, then we have to increase the capacity to the server. That is vertical scaling. Instead of increasing the number of servers, we are increasing the uh, capacity of the server. So that is happening in the relational databases. Second difference is, as we have mentioned, in relational databases, we will be using a predefined schema. We will be defining the structure. But in NoSQL databases, we don't have a predefined schema where every document can have its own structure. And in relational database, every uh, record can have a relation with another record in another table. So that means uh, it's relational. For example, the order information when you store, the order information table or orders table will relate to customer table. The order table will relate to order, order items table or products table, right? That means if I have to fetch the data related to a particular order, I have to connect multiple tables. But in case of NoSQL, that is not there because I already mentioned it is storing every information or every data as an isolated or independent data. If you look at this diagram, so the following entity relationship diagram details the nine entities used in the next session. So here you can see an example like a customer's table, products category table, and a sales orders table. A customer is connected with the sales order. That means a customer can place multiple sales orders. Every sales order will have connection with sales order details table, where the sales order details will store the information about the uh, products uh, sold. And every uh, sales order detail table will have a one-to-one -one relationship with the products table because inside the sales order detail, we will store one products information which will have a mapping in the products table because the product table contains the complete information about the products table. Product category table has a relationship with the product table. It's a one-to-many relationship. And customer will have a customer address relationship. So you can see one customer can have multiple addresses. Suppose if you go to Amazon or Flipkart kind of applications, you can store multiple addresses, delivery addresses or addresses within the account, right? 
and the customer will have a customer password account table because the password will be stored in a hash format so it will be stored in a separate table the password uh, customer password table there is a one to one mapping and product table will have a product tag table relationship sorry product uh, table has a product tags relationship and product tags will have a relationship with the product tag table so this is the uh, entity diagram that shows the relationship between different entities So identify access patterns for your app. So when you are designing a data model for NoSQL database, the objective is to ensure that the operations on the data are done in fewest requests. That means if I have to go and fetch the in related information, usually in a relational database, we have to connect multiple tables. For example, if I have to get the uh, customer information, First, I have to connect to the customer table. Then I have to co connect to the customer address table. Then I have to connect to the customer password table because the complete customer information comes from three different uh, tables, right? But if you are planning to use a NoSQL database, so how we can store this information? We can store the customer's data, customer address data, and password information. Everything can be stored inside a single document. So there is no need to maintain multiple documents. See here, you can see So here you can see this is the customer's personal information, like a customer first name, last name, email address, phone number, etc. And this is the customer address information. So one customer can have multiple addresses of this type. And this is the customer password information. So instead of maintaining them in three different tables, we can create a single customer JSON document. And you can see, here we can store the customer personal information. Inside the address collection, we can store the address information. And inside this password, we can store the password information. So all the information related to the customer goes inside a single document. So the benefit is that when you want to fetch the customer information, you don't need to go and connect to multiple tables. From a single table, you will be able to fetch everything. So when to embed or reference data? There are rules for when you should embed data in the document instead of referring it in a different row. So when should you embed the data? Like whenever there is a one-to-one -one relationship or one-to-few relationship means we can update the records together. Okay, whenever we want to read them together or whenever we want to update them together, we can store all the information in a single document, like a one to one, like a previous example. One customer will have a one password information. So that is a one to one mapping. Or one customer can have a few address informations, right? So like a one address or two address or maximum two, three addresses, right? So in such cases, we can embed all the informations into a single document. When should you reference data? Read or update it independently. So whenever you want to read the information separately, then you have to store them separately in different collections like uh, one to many relationships or many to many relationships means if one customer has multiple orders so don't store all the customer order informations inside the customer uh, collection so maintain a separate collection for orders because 
suppose if you are a regular customer you daily you per make at least two three purchases or uh, two three orders so if you take a one month information one customer may make thousands of orders right so in that case storing all the thousand order informations inside the customer document is not a good practice better you store the order informations separately and use the customer ID inside the order collection. So you can say this order is from this particular customer. So the customer ID can be mentioned inside the order document. Or if there is a many to many relationships, okay, in that case, we can use a reference, uh, which means a uh, relationship like entity uh, foreign key relationship similarly here we can have a collection but collection means we don't establish a foreign key relation but we will refer so the one documents id we can refer from the other document that is a reference next is choosing a partition key So what is partitioning? So when we talk about partitions, there are two types of partitions we use in Cosmos DB. One is a logical partition, another one is a physical partition. Physical partition means a storage disk you can consider. So one disk can store maybe 100 GB data or 1 terabyte data or uh, 100 terabyte of data. So that one disk is one partition. Suppose, uh, assume that I have a storage disk or storage servers where each server can store 100 TB data, 100 terabyte of data. One server can store 100 terabyte data, but I have 500 terabytes of data. So how many servers I need? Totally I need a 500 terabyte. 500 terabyte means I cannot store all these in a single machine because one machine supports 100 terabyte only. So what I'll do is physically five different machines I'll create, which means for five different disk I will create. So one disk can store 100 terabyte Similarly, five disk I will use. So that five disk is called a physical partition because they are physically in different different devices, okay, or different different disk. So that is the physical partition. But logical partition, as the name indicates, it's a logical grouping, okay. For example, very understandable way I can say. In a company, if there are thousands of employees, based on the department, we can group them. Even though all of them belongs to same company, we can group them based on their department. Okay, for example, uh, sales department employees, marketing department employees, or devil, uh, IT employees. So like this, we can group them in different. Uh, uh, sections or logical grouping you can do. Suppose in one group, I have maximum 100 MB data, okay, or uh, 1 TB data. So in one disk, how many partitions I can create? Because one disk means, one disk means 100 terabyte and one group or one employee group, like a sales group, there is only one terabyte of data. In marketing, there is five terabyte of data. In IT, there are maybe 60 terabyte of data. So that means totally I have 60 plus five plus uh, maybe two or one. So that means around 60, 70 uh, terabyte of data is coming. So. I can store all these informations into a single disk. So inside a single disk, I can have multiple logical partitions. 
okay means suppose my disk size is 100 terabyte and one partition suppose consider one department so one department's data size is just a 20 terabyte so i can store that in one party on one disk partition another department may have 30 terabyte of data so that 30 plus 20 still 50 only so that 50 i can store in a single machine right maybe another department having 40 terabyte of data so 40 plus 30 plus 20 that is 90 terabyte of data but the disk capacity is 100 tb so all 90 means three departments data i can store in a single disk which means one physical partition contains multiple logical partitions so you can see that picture here here this is physical partitions so this is you can consider as one server or one machine one disk okay so there are multiple disk we have so this all disk okay and inside one disk we can have a multiple logical partitions so this is one partition this is another partition this is another partition and this is another partition so if you see there are four logical partitions within a single physical partition so that is what that what you have to understand what is the difference between physical and logical partition for your understanding i said 100 tb is one disk storage Suppose if I have 500 TB of data, then I have to use five different physical disks. So each physical disk we can consider as physical partition. But inside one disk, we can store multiple employee groups, means multiple departments data. So suppose one disk may store three departments data, another, dep uh, another disk will store four departments data like that. Okay, so that means one physical partition can store multiple logical partitions. The partition key is used, uh, is required uh, document property that ensures documents with the same partition key value are routed to and stored within the specific physical partition. Okay, so the, whenever we create a container, we will be specifying a partition key. So what is the benefit of partition key is the records which belongs to the same partition key will go to same logical partition and that is within the single physical partition. Right. So for example, if I store the data, maybe I the category is my category is is my partition key and i am storing a partition key uh, value as maybe fruits so fruits is one partition key value it does not store it as fruits it uh, simply hash the value so there is a hashing algorithm is used which hashes the partition key and the hash value is uh, checked within the logical partition so it belongs to which uh, range for example in a numerical representation i can say for example if i say uh, a partition key as fruits okay so apple is the product name and the category is fruits so what it does is it applies a hashing algorithm on the category name that is uh, fruits and it generates a hash value. Suppose I'm representing the hash value with a number. So for example, 20. Okay, 20 is the hash value which is generated. So inside the physical partitions, we, we can have multiple logical partitions. So each logical partition will be storing a range of value, like a 1 to 30 is one partition. 31 to 60 is another partition. 61 to 90, another partition 91 to 2, 1, 150 is another partition 
then 151 to 250 is another partition. So like that, different, different partitions. So when I provide a value fruits as the category, it generates the hash value 20. So 20 belongs to which partition? The first partition. So it goes to the first partition. Maybe another category I'm generating is vegetables. Okay. So that will be hashed and then the hash value which is generated is 25. So 25 also belongs to first partition only. Okay, because first partition is storing a hash value ranges from 1 to 30. So anything which comes within 1 and 30 will go to that. So I'm just giving a number for understanding purpose, but here it is using a hash value. I'm not sure about the partitions. That picture is not given. Let me check. Uh, long back, I have seen a picture in documentation. Yeah, so this is what it is doing. If you look at this, whenever you provide the partition key as city, suppose if the city is London, this will go to one partition. The, here the city is New York, which goes to this partition. Here city is Paris, which also goes to the same partition. So that means it not creating two different partition for these two cities because their hash value may belongs to same partitions, right? So this will go. You can see these are logical partitions. So this will goes to same partition, right? So there is a hashing applied. Let me check. Is there any image which shows that hashing? Yeah, this is Microsoft blog. Yeah, so here you can see. So this is partition by tenant ID. So here tenant ID is the partition key. So it applies a hash function. So we can see there is a hash function applied and that goes to a particular partition. Right. So that means there is a hashing uh, value calculated for every partition key, and then it goes to the appropriate partition. So first of all, we have to avoid hot partitions. So what is meant by hot partitions? So part, when you do or when you select a partition key, it is very, very important that you have to select a partition key that is scalable. So what is the problem? If you select a key which is not distributing the data equally across uh, partitions, then you it may create hot partitions. Okay, so what is the problem with the hot partition is, for example, considering an example uh, okay, so you are creating uh, a movie ticket selling application or like a book my show kind of application. So you decided to create the partition key based on the booking day, whether it is 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. So based on the day, you have to store the data. So the day you will be considering as the partition key. And we know that Saturday and Sunday, there will be lots of bookings, maybe thousands and thousands of bookings will come. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there will be very less number of bookings, right? So if you consider the booking day as the partition key, what is the problem? Whatever bookings will happen on Saturday and Sunday all goes to same partitions, right? So that means, suppose even if there are two different partitions, there is a Saturday records will be stored in one partition, Sunday records will be stored in another partition. So the most means 90 percentage or 95 percentage of the records will go to that partitions only. Rest of the partition, like there is a partition for Monday, there is a partition for Sun, uh, Tuesday, there is a partition for Wednesday. There are very few records going because we know if in a week, if there are 1000 bookings happening, 900 bookings will be on Saturdays and Sundays because people will be moving, mostly watching movies on week, weekends, right? So weekdays they will be working. So very less number of bookings may happen. So if you see the number of records which goes inside the particular partition is very, very high. So when you do a read and write to the database, it always hitting a same partition. So always writing into the same partition, always reading from the same partition. So that is not a good approach. So when you choose a partition key, you have to select a key that equally distribute the data across the partitions. Okay. For example, in uh, e-commerce applications, we can select the category, product category. So in an e-commerce application like Amazon or Flipkart, everyone is buying all types of products. Some people are interested in electronics items. Some people are interested in uh, uh, maybe uh, cosmetic items. Some people are interested in uh, books. Some people are interested in dresses. So there are different categories of items. So if the category, if you select as the partition key, the recorded distribution will be almost equal. It's not equal, but at least the equal distribution will happen in every partition. So selecting the partition key is very, very, very important to enable scaling. When the data is not partitioned correctly, it can result in hot partitions. Hot partitions prevent your application workload from scaling because there is scaling means if you are if the number of categories increasing number of partitions will increase but if it is all going into a single category or single uh, partition then there is no scaling happens right so avoid creating hot partitions okay. consider reads versus writes when you are choosing a partition key, you also need to consider whether the data is read heavy or write heavy. Okay, so if you are creating a record, you have to understand whether you are using that uh, uh, document very frequently or not. Means you are reading that. that as the partition key. For example, you will be reading the records based on the ID or based on the name or based on the department. So based on which key you are writing the condition, use that as the partition key. So that means you will be writing or you will be reading uh, data from a particular partition. So when you perform read heavy operations, the records, sorry, the read request can fetch the data from a single partition, which will be faster. But there can be cross partition queries. Cross partition query means suppose uh, you are storing the products informations using category as the partition key. But when you 
search the records, you will be searching based on the price value. So price value is uh, distributed across all the partitions, right? So you your database has to do a search across all the partitions to get the matching record. So that will be a little slow, right? Because searching all the uh, location. Suppose if there are 100 rooms, means 100 partitions, searching on all the 100 rooms is will be very difficult. But I know that, okay, go and get it, the record from a single room will be very easy. So if you are doing a search operation using the partition key, it will be faster. Okay, so use the partition key, which is mostly appearing in the queries. For example, here you can see select star from C where C dot username equal to mark. So then you can use username as the partition key because most of the data operations, the query operations are based on the username. So you have to just uh, fetch a particular partition instead of spreading across multiple partitions. Okay, but if you use a favorite color here, right side, you can see cross partition query. Select star from C, where uh, C dot favorite color equal to orange. So you can see there are multiple users. They have favorite color as orange. So you have to go to each partition and check whether their favorite color is orange or not. So that will take time. That will be a little slow. Okay, but if you write a query, which is directly hitting your partition key it will be faster. Choose a partition key for customers. Now that you understand the partitioning in the Azure Cosmos DB, we can decide a partition key for our customer data. Okay, so here uh, customer partition key is ID. So we can create a customer update a customer, retrieve a customer by using the ID. You can see whenever we perform the write operation, we use the ID. Whenever we update the record, we use the ID. Whenever we retrieve the customer data, we use the ID. So for every purpose, we are using ID as the uh, key. So in that case, it is better to use ID as the partition key because if I'm saying, okay, go and fetch the details of the employee or user or customer with the ID X, that means it has to go and search only a particular partition instead of spreading across multiple partition, right? So customer ID, you can use as a uh, partition key. Model small lookup entities. Our data model includes two small reference data entities, that is product category and the product tag. You can see product category will connect to product and the product will connect to product uh, tags and product tags will connect to the product tag. Okay, so how we will choose the partition key? Model product categories. So product for the product category, which can be the partition key? Because every collection requires a partition key, right? So if you see product category, if you select, which can be the partition key? Create a product category, edit product category, list all the product categories. So you can create an additional column to specify what is the category type, right? So uh, some cases we may have to explicitly add additional records or additional columns. Okay, uh, I think it is called, uh, sometimes we use a synthetic column. Synthetic column means that data is only used for the partition purposes, but we use it for additional, uh, so we are not using it for any querying purposes. We use it for partition key purposes. Okay, so in this case, you can see we are explicitly adding one category column like a type equal to category. And uh, in the product tag, we can also add a type to specify because name and ID 
is not suitable for the uh, partitioning. So we can uh, use a type as the partition key. Means you, wherever you need, you can add additional columns for partition keys. Okay, so, but we may not use them inside the uh, read write operations. But if there is uh, equal distribution required, then you can add additional columns also. So synthetic key, synthetic key means if you are planning to uh, create a partition key, but there is no suitable column or suitable attribute found, you can create an additional column, which is called the synthetic column or synthetic key, which is used for the partitioning. Design a Partitioning strategy. Denormalize the data in your model. So let's model a product table from our relational database into NoSQL database. The product or product tags relational database. Okay, so here if you see uh, the product table which is connected to product tags. So every product will have uh, the product tags, right? So means one product will be having a tag associated with that. So when you model uh, the, the uh, data, you can st uh, store the product's information, the tag information within the, uh, the document itself. Okay. So when you select a uh, product record, the product tag informations can come along with this. Okay, so here you can see when we convert that into a document types, the tag IDs can be comes inside this because the product will be belongs to, uh, the product can have multiple tags. In that cases, that IDs, the tag IDs can be stored inside a array type. So you can see tag IDs, you can store as a list. Okay, suppose if you search for a product, the same product may belongs to multiple categories. Categories in the sense tag, tagging can be done. Okay, for example, um, television. So television will be coming uh, tagged as an in the electronic device. Television is tagged as an entertainment device. So television can be uh, tagged as a display device. Okay, so that means television is a single product, but it has multiple tags associated with that. So what is the benefit? If somebody is searching for electronic device, television will appear because there is a tag associated with that. If somebody is searching for display device, the television will appear there also. Okay. Because television has multiple tags associated with that. So all these tags we can store inside a that itself. Okay. So instead of uh, simply storing the tag IDs, the complete tag informations we can store inside this. So here you can see the tags in uh, tags column is converted into an array of tag objects. So here you can see. The uh, tags object, sorry, tags array contains the tags informations, which means every product will have multiple tags, and each tag will have a ID and name. So instead of storing only the IDs, we can denormalize this by adding the complete info tag informations within the the product collection or product entity. So here you can see when we select a partition key for the product. So we can see the uh, query which we write, like a select star from C where C dot category ID equal to category A, which means we are performing a, a search operation based on the category ID. 
So in that cases, we can create a partition key that is uh, category ID so that whenever we uh, perform a search operation, it directly goes into a particular category. For example, if I'm searching for uh, a particular product category, instead of spreading, uh, in, instead of uh, spreading the query across multiple partitions, the search query can hit a single partition. For example, select star from collection where category equal to fruits, which means it will directly goes to the fruits category and then get all the fruits from there. So uh, instead of using some other columns like the price or quantity or something, we can use the category ID or category name as the uh, partition key. So it will be searching the records directly from a particular partition. Manage referential integrity by using the change feed. So change feed uh, means when you perform the database operations in Cosmos DB, it automatically generates some events. Okay, so uh, if you want to see that event information, I can show you that. So to understand the change feed, um, <laughs> for that let's okay, let's go with the so this is going to create a function azure function that is listening to the change feed of the container so change feed means if there is some incident happens inside your uh, Cosmos DB account, it automatically triggers an event. Okay, so that is called a change feed. So this is which one, the first one, right? The function does not exist. Okay, let me create a function. So I'm just creating a function just to listen for the change feed actions. So the change feed as the as it is specifying the change feed is the uh, events 
uh, information that is generated by Cosmos DB that send the events information. So what action happened, okay, or uh, uh, in which record it is happened, that information will be sent as a change feed. So based on that, you can update another record. For example, uh, when you denormalize the data, like shown on product, product category, and product tables, like this, product category, product tag, and the product, okay? So referential integrity must be maintained when changes occurs on the categories or tags. For example, whenever some changes happens in this table or this table, automatically it should update here also. For example, if somebody is uh, renaming the category, okay, so where suppose the current category name is uh, uh, electronics, okay. So that electronics is the category name and there are lots of products which has electronics as the tag value or category. Okay. So when, when somebody is renaming this category and changing to something else, okay, or maybe electronic items, simply electronics change to electronics items. Okay. So when we make updation inside the product category table, the same change should reflect in all the products which comes in that particular category, right? So how it happens here? For that, you have to first listen to the events generated by this. For example, when somebody changes, makes changes here in this product category, it will generate a change feed event. Some application needs to listen that event and make the appropriate changes in the destination table. For example, here you can see the product category, when it is updated, it generates a change field. So that change field will contain what changes happen. That information is then executing a function. You can see here is an Azure function. So this function will understand what changes need to be done in the product table. So if it is an update operation, so what is the updation happen? If the name is modified, it will do all the name updations in the product table. So we can use a function to listen the change feed events and then make the appropriate changes in the target table or target collection. So that what I'm trying to do here. Let's see. Okay, so here is a function. So I can create Dot directly, you cannot create here. It should support. No, I have to go back. Dotnet is not supporting. Okay, let's. Dotnet is, I don't want to write the code locally and then publish. So what I do is online editor is not supporting the C sharp here. So we'll try the Node.js. So Node.js, I think it should support the online editor. So let's create a function again. And I'll select the language as I think C, uh, sorry, the Node.js should support the online code editor. Let's see.
Okay, I think this is supporting the online code editor. <clears throat> this Cosmos DB to the I think this is the I think it is product symbol. Example DBM products. Does this require HTTP function or Cosmos trigger function? Let's see. Okay, so here is the function we can create from here. So that's change the function. Language JavaScript. Okay, so here, here I'm creating a function. So here itself is an option for creating a function. So this function will listen to the change feed. Means the events, the events which is So this is the change feed function, which is generated. Okay, so this is the change feed function, which is connected with the Cosmos DB. Now we will see whenever I make some changes inside this products collection, whether it will update here or not, or whether it will trigger this function or not. So for triggering, let me check the logs here. Now I go to products items. So this category or, or price something is there if i'm if i want to update i can update this value okay and then click on update so i have updated this document and let's see whether it is triggering this function or not it may take some time to Trigger it here.
or it will go to the storage account also. Which one is connected to this? This is connected to Cosmos DB. There is no invocation happened. Why it is not triggering this event? So this is creating a function that this function is created. So this is a function we have created. Whenever there is a item is modified, it will trigger. That will trigger the function. Let me verify whether the integration is correct. Binding type is Cosmos DB. Container of name and this is not mentioned. Okay.
Now let me try to update something. Still not updating. Okay, so now we can see it is invoked. So it took some time. So the problem was in the integration, the collection name was not updated. So here now you can see document ID. So this is the document ID which is modified, right? So you can see now 1021 something, right? So this is the this is the document. So whenever we make changes in one document, it will send a signal or it will send a notification to the Azure function. So the function will understand there is something modified in the document. So that document is received here. So that documents information so you can update in another collection. So that you can do here. So here you can just update the uh, target collection based on the change feed. So what is change feed? So here you will get the input variable. In, inside the input variable, you will be getting the modified documents information. So that modified documents you can get based on that you can update a target collection. Okay. So that is the uh, change feed. So this is the this is what they have mentioned in this, how to manage the referential integrity. Because in one of the slide, we have mentioned that uh, we can create relationships uh, or we can use embedded documents or references. Embedded documents means if we have one-to-one -one mapping or one-to-few mapping, we will be integrating within the parent document. But if uh, one to many or many to many relationships, then we will be keeping them two separate collections. And whenever one collection is updated, we have to go and update the other collection accordingly. But how to do that? So that is what mentioned here. When we make some changes in one collection, it is generating a change feed. So change feed is nothing but a signal or event. So based on that event, we have to update the second collection. So here you can see whenever the product category is modified, it is generating a change feed that is captured by the function. And the function's responsibility is to update the target collection. So in our case, I showed you how the change feed can, can be captured by a function. right? So whenever I make some changes, Whenever I make some changes in my, uh, in the uh, collection, means in the documents, it will update or it will execute that function. For example, if I'm changing the quantity from 30 to 60 and then updates. So it should execute that function here. See, so here the function is triggered. So now inside the function, we have to write the logic for updating the other collection. Okay, this is how the change feed works. So combine multiple entities in the same container. So it in some scenarios, we may have to get the records from multiple uh, documents or multiple uh, items. So in uh, relational databases, we typically use the uh, join queries to get the data. But here, when we have to get the data from multiple documents, then we can write something like this. Okay, select star from C where customer ID equal to this and the C type equal to this. So it will be going into uh, a particular partition and get the data from different uh, documents. Okay, so you can 
write the queries that uh, uh, connect to multiple documents within the partition. So maybe the query is, can be a cross partition query or to a single partition query. So cross partition queries uh, limitation is it uh, spread the query across multiple partitions. So it will be a little slow. So if you include a partition key within the query, then it will stick to a single partition. You have nearly finished remodeling your database. You have transformed a nine relational database tables into four containers in for our NoSQL database. So you can specify, uh, means in, in our relational database, if you see the previous example, we have uh, nine different tables. When we create or we, when we convert them into uh, a NoSQL database, we have to just create a uh, collection or uh, database collection like this. So product category, so where partition key can be a type, product tag, partition key can be type, and product meta, which uh, where you store the product tag and product category, and customer, which contains the product category as uh, customer ID, sorry, primary key, sorry, partition key as customer ID, Product meta, which is the type, uh, is the partition key, and product, which is the category ID, right? So, product is the collection where category ID will be the partition key, customer will be one collection where partition key will be customer ID, and another one is product meta, that is the meta information should be stored. So there you can store the product tag and product category. So there is a lab associated with this as well. So if you have the Azure account, you can create uh, the Cosmos DB account and implement this lab by looking into the documents which I have shared, the list of uh, lab documents which I have shared. So now I'm not going into the other uh, modules because the module wise, if I go, it will be very lengthy. So I can show some other features which we have in Cosmos DB. One is the geo replication option. If you go to Cosmos DB, you can see a, a settings tab. Under the settings, you will be able to see the replication option. So replicate data globally, which means you can enable the geo replication and you can also enable automatic failover or manual failover. So currently you can see this is the location where your data resides. This is the primary location. But if you want to enable geo replication, you have to go and enable this. So for that, I think previously, oh yeah, here is the option for enabling geo redundancy. You can click and enable this. So I said already, uh, even after creating the database also, you can enable geo redundancy. So I have just enabled the geo redundancy. It may take another two minutes to update. Let's wait for that to complete.
you can see uh, it may take some time to update the geo application. Still, it's updating. You can see it's still updating. OK, so uh, I think it may take some time. By the time I'll talk about the consistency models. To so look at the consistency models, there are five consistency levels you can see in Cosmos DB. Starting from strong, bounded staleness, session, consistent prefix and eventual. So what is this consistency levels means? See, whenever you perform a write operation, and immediately you perform a read operation also. How? Uh, quickly you will get the updated data. That is decided by the consistency. So if you configure the consistency level to a least one, that is eventual, you may get uncommitted data also, because whenever you insert a document, it will go first into the primary copy and then replicated into the other copies. But before re replicating into the replicas, when you make a read read operation, the read replicas will be returning a, a list of document that may not contain the newly inserted data. So that means you cannot predict the behavior of the output. For example, here you can see. So you may be wondering why this music symbols are coming here. So don't worry. This is just to demonstrate the use of eventual consistency. You can see we are writing the data in this order. You can see we are writing red, blue, uh, then uh, purple, then black. But you can see the other locations. So this is same location. This is another location. This is another location. But in another locations, it is not in the same order. You can see here the red is written first. This is the right, right location. But these are all read locations. OK, so when you write the data into the right location, the other locations will be reading the data in a different order because that data is not yet committed into the replicas, maybe in a different region. OK, for example, I'm writing red, blue and purple. So if you see it's not in the same order, the other locations are receiving. So here you can see purple is coming first, then red is coming, then blue is coming, then black is coming. Okay. So that means the order of writing the data is not maintained while reading the data. Okay, Because in this consistency model, we are not bothering about the order. How quickly we can get the data, whatever is available, just give me the data. Like our social media applications, like if you go to Facebook, when you update or sorry, when you load the Facebook page, it shows the information to the customer, but it, it may not be in the correct order of the posted date or posted time. It shows lots of information, but maybe some older data will appear now. Two days old data will appear or maybe yesterday's data will appear or today's data will appear. Again, some older data will appear. That means the order is not maintained. Because such applications responsibility is to show the data to the customer, not maintaining the order. So what they are going to do by maintaining the order? 
people using the facebook or such kind of uh, applications just for entertainment purpose okay it's not mandatory that it has to show the data in the proper order so if the order is not a matter if the data is showing even if it is uncommitted doesn't matter such cases we can go for eventual consistency which returns the data very quickly okay but if you go with the consistent prefix you can see so here if you uh, go with the consistent prefix you can see the data is written in this order that is red blue purple black order and if the data returned is also in the same order means the order is always maintained but there will be a delay yes you can see the red is written here and blue is written but there is a huge gap here for getting the blue then purple then black right so that means some locations they will get it quickly some locations it will get with a delay so what is the delay how how much delay there is uh, for getting the data that we cannot predict there is a delay but the data will come in the order that's for sure such cases we can go for consistent prefix so sometimes the delay will be less sometimes the delay will be higher we can see in some places delay is more some places delay will be less okay such cases we go for consistent prefix that means yes delay is not a problem but we need the ordered data we need the ordered data delay is not a problem okay but bounded staleness if you see in bounded staleness it is exactly similar to consistent prefix but what is the maximum delay you can define for example here if i am saying maximum lag of operations is 100 or maximum lag is 5 second what is it means whenever i perform a write operation within 5 seconds it will be available in all the other locations so maximum delay is 5 seconds so within 5 seconds this data will be available in all the other locations maybe some locations it will there will be a delay of 2 seconds some locations there will be a delay of uh, 3 seconds some locations it will, there will be a delay of 1 second some locations maximum delay is 5 that is max to maximum 5 seconds delay but within 5 seconds the same data will be available in other locations okay so that is bounded staleness so here order is maintained plus it will also ensure the data is visible to others within a particular delay so either uh, you can specify the duration or you can specify the maximum lag of operation. For example, here I'm writing the first record, second record, third record, fourth record, then other locations, the first record will appear. So there is a delay of four record because in the right location, I have reached the fourth record, then only the first record is appeared in the other location. So there is the, the read location is four record behind the right location. So how many records maximum delay or behind you can go that is defined here maximum lag so it can be either number of operations or duration so maximum five seconds delay or 10 seconds delay or maximum n number of operations delay so that delay you can define that is bounded staleness in consistent prefix yes there is a delay but that delay you cannot control strong if you see whenever you write the data in uh, right location whenever the uh, data is available in the same location the other location also will get the same data that means every location or every client will be reading the data at the same time same order okay it's not like that some people will get the data first some people will get the data later. Okay. Everyone will be getting the data at the same time. This is mainly used in stock marketing or gaming applications. Because if I am play, doing a playing a multiplayer game, game, and suppose if I'm doing a shoot, 
a gunshot. If some players will see that gunshot first and some players will see that gunshot later, will that work? No. So when I perform the gunshot operation, the same action should be visible to all the players at the same time. Right. So that such cases, we will go for strong consistency. Or in case of stock marketing, whenever the stock value updates, all the customers should get the update at the same time. It's not like that some customers will get the stock updations first. Some customers will get the stock updation later. That's not works. Right. So such cases, we go for strong consistency. Now, what is session? Session means when a user in enables a session, for that session users, it will be in the strong consistency model, but others, it will be in the consistent prefix model. For example, you can see here, this is Southeast Asia writing location session A. This is Southeast Asia read location session A. This is East Asia read location session A. So if you see these three are session A. And this is session B. If you look at for session A, it maintains the order as well as the time. Means it works like a strong consistency. But for the session B, there is order maintained, but there is a delay. Right. So that means it's a mix of strong and consistent prefix. So for the same session, it will be strong consistency. For other sessions, it will be consistent prefix. That is the consistency levels we can set. So session is the default consistency level. But if you want, you can change it to eventual and save it. OK, so then all the operations will be following this eventual consistency. OK, but I don't want to update. Let it be. Now coming to the replicas. We have enabled the geo replication and you can see now I can select the replication locations and click on save. Oh. OK, your the account is currently configured with a total throughput of max 4000. So, OK, I cannot replicate to other location. Because the account's maximum throughput is. What is the impression? is configured for thousand. But I think we have configured. Okay, I think in our accounts. Okay, so this there is a cap set for the account. So I just updated for the total throughput limit.
Okay, still it's updating, so it may take some time. Okay, so geo replication means we can choose the locations wherever you want to replicate your data. So you can see I'm selecting the Central India, then East Asia, and maybe uh, I think two locations will be able to select. Okay, if I select save, then it will be replicating the data to that locations. And then I can do a failover. So normally the automatic failover happens, which means whenever the primary location that is Southeast Asia is failed, it will automatically switch to the next uh, location, which is the next location configured in the order. It will be automatically switched to failover to that location. But if I want to enable manual failover, I can configure the geo uh, replicated locations and go to the manual failover and manually switch from Southeast Asia to another location. So that is possible. But understand whenever you create a new replica, you will be charging accordingly. Okay. So that means if you replicate to other locations, Whenever you write the data in one location, it is automatically replicated to other location sessions. So storage and compute cost is uh, added, means your cost will be increased because you are enabling geo replication. Okay, so that's it. Overall, Cosmos DB's uh, features it's not covered all the modules, and it's not possible to cover all the modules, but the core features and functionalities we have discussed in this session. So that's it uh, from my side. Now, if you have any questions, you can put your questions here. Archie, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you can now take over. So I have done with my session. Uh, thank you, sir, for this grateful session. Guys, don't forget to fill this feedback form.